Okay. So in this work, I remembered the foundation, the foundation of my marriage, and I remembered who I married, and I found that person again. And he's back, and he's been sober for over seven years now. And um, he also um, speaks about addiction. He went into the field of addiction. He was suspended from practicing law, and he ended up teaching at Inbalance Ranch Academy um, and working as a, um, the head of a, a sober living house here in Tucson. And now he's a public defender, and he is so happy to be back practicing law and helping people and specifically working with indigent population and specifically working with those clients who are suffering from addiction. Um, and he actually works in Yuma. So I'm a single parent during the week, Monday through Friday, and he comes home on the weekends. So these are our first three dogs <laughs> on the end there. That's how it all started. They were all mine, by the way. The gateway, yeah, gateway dogs. <laughs> all from the Humane Society. So the other thing I did to process through what was happening in my world was I got strong. I got strong, you know, I, I, knew to, I needed to be strong on the inside and the outside. And um, there was a little Groupon for a CrossFit, and so I thought I'd try that. And I got hooked. And so I started doing things and challenging myself um, in ways that I never um, thought possible. That, that's like, I don't know if you can see, that's like me climbing up a rope. Um, I started rowing, which I've never done. I did these crazy races. Um, and I, and um, Joanna said I compete at a master's level. That means I'm old. It does not mean I'm good. It does not mean I'm good. Master's is just the age. So I just want to make that clear. Um, but I've, um, that community, that CrossFit community, when I needed support and I felt so alone, that's where I found it. And so Christina's here from my CrossFit community. Um, and this is, it, it's like people I never, never would meet um, in my regular life. And I have found my um, just very, really close dear friends. And you can come into the CrossFit community at any athletic shape with any issues and you will be accepted. And that's where I found my people. So now I lift heavy weights and I climb ropes and I, my hands are always calloused. And I love it. So um, because of my experiences, I try to bring a lot of humanity to the courtroom and do things a little bit differently than probably other benches do or other courtrooms do. And I started several programs. I started a program of using therapy dogs at juvenile court. Um, and so we have teams of therapy dogs that come down to court. We also have uh, every other month bring your pet to work day for employees. So we've actually had goats come to work. <laughs> that was really funny because they ate a bunch of stuff out of the recycling bin. <laughs> and we couldn't stop them. They were like running around. They were like baby goats, the kinds that wear pajamas, you know? I mean, they were, they were marvelous and they ate a lot of things that they weren't meant to eat. Um, and then, um, this is my, she's now 15 years old, um, therapy dog, Penelope, and she worked on the bench with me for um, when I was at juvenile court. She would come almost every day, and um, she's a wonderful um, standard poodle. This is um, Josie, and Josie is in the process of, of training right now. She's a lab mixed with a rat terrier. We thought she was a chihuahua, but she weighs 50 pounds. So. Um, <laughs> She was dropped off at a box at juvenile court in January of 2015. She was tiny, I could hold her in one hand. Now, I cannot hold her in one hand. She's huge and she needs to lose 15 pounds apparently. But we just say she's curvy. Um, stuffed animals. So a lot of kids when they come to court, they're really scared. And at juvenile court, there's kids in every single court hearing. And so I started um, saying, you know, it'd be nice if they just had something to hang on to. And I put out a call for help with my Smith College friends and this is what happened. <laughs> so word traveled through the community, and this little boy, whose grandma is a smithy, um, called me and said, I collected 800 stuffed animals for your courtroom. <laughs> and I was sort of in disbelief. I was like, yeah, right. I mean, who would count that high, right? To <laughs> one, two, I mean, right, 800, yeah, right. It's probably eight boxes. And he showed up with a moving van, his, like, like a, it was crazy. And, there you have it. So um, 
I think his grandma was actually connected to the Smith uh, to the rescue community. That's how I connected with him. So um, I um, give kids stuffed animals at juvenile court and books as well. And um, I brought that to the probate bench too. In probate, we have minor guardianships and adult guardianships. And oftentimes the adults may be 60, but they're, they may be more like at an age five. And I had so many adults want to hold an animal during that court hearing, and it was really wonderful. And um, the probate uh, lawyers caught wind of this, and now every year, the Young Lawyers Division does a, a drive to raise stuffed animals for the probate bench. And the kids in, in a guardianship, they're, they're the same kids, the same population we'd see at juvenile court in a dependency, except for the fact that they have a relative who's able to step in and be a guardian before the state does. So we have kids whose parents are incarcerated, kids whose parents are dead, kids whose parents have disappeared, and um, they are just as traumatized as the kids at, at juvenile court. And having those animals has just, um, it's just been wonderful, and it just took off. So um, you heard about my 10 dogs. The other thing I started doing during this time period was fostering. Again, my mom thought I was crazy. Um, but I, I felt like, I can't fix everyone in my courtroom. I just can't. But I can't, and I can't write big checks, but I can save one life at a time. And so I find deep like value and meaning in saving dogs. And so I frequently drive down to Nogales to the Santa Cruz shelter. It's a high kill shelter. It's a corrugated blue like uh, container. It's the most awful place. In the winter, it's freezing cold. In the summer, it's sweltering hot. They have no marketing plan for adoption. And for whatever reason, they get the best dogs. <laughs> they get amazing dogs. And um, so I drove down um, December of 2017 to pick up eight dogs. And as I was leaving in my station wagon filled with crates, they were dragging this guy down the hall. And, um, I said, well, wait, 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 where is he going? And they said, his number's up. He's being euthanized. And I said, no, he's not. I have room. I have room in my car. And um, they said, well, you're out of crates. And I said, I don't care. He'll sit on my lap. You know, he's not, you're not euthanizing him. And I didn't even know what he was. I, I mean, he was so matted. I, his penis was matted to his um, tummy. His butt was matted. He couldn't, it was terrible. And he was so, the mats were so sore, he could, could barely walk. But more than anything, he was terrified. He was just submitting. He was so scared. So I picked him up and um, got him in the car. And if, if anyone works for Border Patrol, I'd love to see the pictures of me going through that. that <laughs> because usually, by the time I get to that Border Patrol stop, at least one or two animals have gotten out of their crates. I don't know how, but they do. And then I'm driving, and I have like a dog here. <laughs> And like, and sometimes like feces on my face, you know. I, and I'm, I'm sure I'm like, mm, you know. So there, there, there goes that lady again. So I got this guy home, and I groomed him. That's the other, I've, I've become a dog groomer too, so. I groomed him, and he was a purebred schnauzer. That's him. Isn't that amazing? So, um, so you never know what you're looking at at the shelter. It may be a, a, a diamond in the rough. So these are some of my foster dogs that ha I've had. My daughter, who's also a family counselor, um, brought home a little dog like that that was so mad that it took three groomings because, you know, it was oh, so yeah. bad. It comes off like a pelt. And it was a, a shih tzu mm -hmm. underneath all that. Yeah. Mess. Yeah. Yeah, and um, this guy was adopted by a wonderful man who lost his schnauzer about five years ago. He was hit by a car. And I was talking, we had named him Manny, like the um, elephant creature in that movie, Ice Age. And I was talking to Manny in the kitchen, and I was saying, that, you know, this guy's going to come meet you. And he used to have a dog named Jake. And Manny went, and I said, Jake. I said, oh my god, is your name Jake? <laughs> and it was really weird. And this dog was about five years old. The timing was all right. And I, I said this, I'd never met. Uh, Patrick, who came over to meet him, and um, I said, look, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I was telling Manny that you were coming, and I used the, the name J-A-K-E, and he really seems to react to it, and Patrick said, are you Jake? Are you Jake? And this dog, it, it was, and this is before that movie came out, <laughs> spinning, and so he's Jake. They, he named him Jake. 
And he's compl and that's the other thing that's so valuable. You're you're saving an animal, but you're also creating a family. And I love that part of it. And Hannah is here who adopted Olive. Hannah is my former law clerk, and she adopted one of my favorites. Who Olive, her dog was dropped out, off at a pawn shop, if you can imagine. So, okay. So probate court. I told you a little bit about minor guardianships, um, and adult guardianships, probate of estates. Um, I want to. I don't. How am I going too long? What time is it? Are we good? Good. Okay. So um, a couple of. Um, Interesting cases. Um, the adult guardianships were really sad because there were often the neglect of our aging population is so acute, and I don't think a lot of people are really aware of it. But I had so many elderly people who were found like locked in rooms with jugs of urine. It was just unacceptable, unacceptable. Um, I had a, a young man who was about 25 years old who was deaf, and his mother passed away, and finally someone discovered him. And he'd never been in school, he had never been taught. Um, proper sign language, he had learned sign language by watching TV. So he would turn on the captioning at the bottom of the TV, and that's how he'd learned how to communicate. In terms of minor guardianships, um, we had a lot of uh, young people crossing the border unaccompanied before we had heard what was happening at the border. So when I was on the probate bench, we had a lot of kids as young as eight crossing the border by themselves. And they uh, were granted special immigration status in my courtroom. Um, okay. Mental health is, um, the mental health bench is part of probate, and I really think it's probably the most important forgotten bench, and that's um, because there's only two commissioners who do mental health hearings. No one, it's not, no one goes to watch a mental health hearing. They're held all over town, so at Palo Verde, Sonora Behavioral Health, and down at Keno, we're doing hearings every single day for acutely, seriously mentally ill people. And I learned so much about these diseases that flow into our family law bench, into juvenile court, and I found it to be just an invaluable experience. Um, some of the more uh, memorable cases were um, very unusual diagnoses. Um, there was a woman who had disassociative identity disorder, which is the new word for uh, split personality or multiple personality. And she had been found in a shed um, in winter, uh, completely naked and chained up. And she'd been beaten and gang raped and sodomized with a stick that had nails on it. She nearly died. And she had been released um, from TMC to her mom. She was only about maybe 22 or 23. And about three weeks later, she was found back at the same house again. And then someone petitioned her, and that's when I got the case. And during the court hearing, she actually turned into three different people. I'd never seen anything like it before, like her, her jawline changed, her physical features changed right before my eyes. It was, um, it, it was like something you would see in a movie. And one of her personalities was a four-year-old child. And one of the things we know about this disease is that the origins are generally in trauma as a childhood, in childhood trauma. So there, it's in a form of, of truly flight versus fight, um, your brain absolutely taking over and protecting you. So this four-year-old child came out, and then one of her personalities was a, a, a female officer, police officer. And she came through at one point. And then the other personality was a male uncle who um, I think was a caricature of, of the person who probably abused her initially. And when she, when she came out of these different personalities, um, she said, um, I asked her, why, why, did, why did you go back? And she said, because I'm worthless. I'm nothing. And I know these guys will do it to someone else. And that whoever they do it to might have more to live for than I do. And so what's... I may as well be there. I just, it may as well be me. And it was heartbreaking, heart-wrenching. Um, and we did get her court-ordered treatment. You know, I don't know what the status is. I don't know what happened. Because with mental health hearings, I didn't get them back again unless they came off a court order and came back the following year. 
but that was really, um, really hard for me to see. Um, the other thing is catatonia. I'd never seen that before. So people are literally catatonic. And so I had you know, a woman who stood up in the middle of the court hearing, and it's just around a round table. It doesn't look like a courtroom. It could be just like this table. But she, she just stood up, and she kind of stood on one leg and was like not moving at all. And I didn't know what was happening. You know, I didn't know, what is she doing? Is she, you know, what's happening here? She's going to fall over. Um, but this incredible, that again, the brain taking over. And this is a, an absolute fright kind of thing. So the hearing was very stressful for her, and she couldn't handle it. And so she absolutely disappeared into her body and just let her body go rigid. Um, a lot of times in mental health hearings, it's different than a normal hearing because there's a lot of exchange between the judge and the mentally ill patient. And I learned that I needed to have a response, like a, you know, because they expect you to talk to them. Whereas in a normal courtroom, there's procedure and you don't have like a regular conversation um, with someone, kind of a back and forth usually. And so I learned that um, mental Ill, mentally ill patients, 88% of them go to a hearing, first of all, a trial, whereas the trial rate for family law cases is 8.4%. So 88% of these folks ask for a hearing. And when they would say something, they would look to me for confirmation, like an acknowledgment. And so I learned that I just would say, I understand. I understand. And that would keep folks going. But sometimes people would say things, and I'd get ready with, I had a I'd get ready with my statement, and it would work. But sometimes I w people would say things, and before I had kind of processed it, my I understand would come out. So I had one patient who accused me of stealing his semen, and I said, I understand. I'm like, no, 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 I don't understand. I don't, I did not do that. I did not do that. Um, so there were humorous moments during these, some of these hearings. But um, it's tragic seeing people who are so lost. We would see people, we there was a lawyer from the Department of Justice who worked in DC who was found in the middle of, des of the desert just alone. Like, and you don't have, they don't have ID. You don't know where their families are. And I would see the um, young people who were having their first break, 18, 19 years old, and all their family is there. And the next case would be a 65-year-old, and no one's there because the disease is so debilitating, so hard. Um, and I, I did a lot of research into the history of mental health and, and I, because I found it so fascinating. And we're doing better now, um, better than when in the um, BC, in 1900 BC, where we thought that women who had, were mentally ill, it was an issue because that their uterus had wandered. And so they would use like smells to pull the uterus back into place thinking that that would help uh, mentally ill women. Um, when that didn't work, we started burning women, right, witches. So which we think about 100,000 mentally ill women were actually burned at the stake, which is all, all because they were mentally ill. This is trephination. This is what we used to do to mentally ill patients. We drill holes in their head and to drain the evil spirits. A lot of really interesting artwork in this time period in the really early Middle Ages. This is the um, mental health hospital right behind my college. And um, it's all boarded up. So in, at the peak of the time when the United States was institutionalizing people, there were about 559,000 mentally ill people kept in institutions. And then in the 1950s, we started developing drugs to help treat uh, mentally ill patients. And all of a sudden, we changed, uh, we realized there were treatment options, and we turned towards more of a community um, treatment based focus. And so the answer um, and the solution at the time was just close all the hospitals. So we released hundreds of thousands of mentally ill patients onto the streets without providing the proper care. And we still haven't learned our lesson in terms of how we treat the mentally ill. It is not a perfect situation. I just read a person to it on a book on tape, but it's just a book that just came out recently, Rosemary. It was about the hidden Kennedy daughter. Oh, talking yeah. In the 1920s, not that long ago. I believe in eugenics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, set mm -hmm. up for parties with whoever and yeah, that, that long ago. Yeah, um, in the in the early early um, 1900s 
in both Europe and um, in the United States, mentally ill people would be put outside during the day to be sort of gawked at, like, like circus, like sort of a circus freak show, and people would throw money, and that was how they earned their keep, essentially. It's horrifying. OK. All right, moving on from that. First impressions, family law. So this is uh, the family law. This is the, the hallway. So um, I do uh, divorce. I do paternity, grandparent visitation, um, children's issues, so child support, legal decision making, parenting time issues. Um, and this is the first thing that people see in our courtroom. So it's, as you can, I, I, you can't really tell yet, but I'll give you a, a juxtaposition. There's juvenile court. Do you see the difference? I'll go back. Look at the difference in the, in the seating. There's little people seats for kids. These are all MRSA resistant, by the way. And they're round. <laughs> it's true, they are. Um, they're, look, see how they're curved? So it's, it's, there's a sense of we're working together, whereas on the family law bench, we are not working together. We are isolated, and we are going to be in opposition. Um, so it's a, it's a huge difference. Um, this is my courtroom. This is what it looks like. My courtroom is probably a little bit different than some people's. I have artwork up. Mom, remember those pieces that you brought from Peru? They're right here. They're right here. I have flowers. Um, but I can't just change this. It's divided, right? So people are always in opposition in my courtroom. That's the view from if you're testifying. So I try to put things up on the bench that are um, a little bit more peaceful, so it's some kind of neutral, like peaceful colors for people. This is my courtroom at juvenile court. Totally different. Look at the round. Everyone sits at the same table. I have children's artwork, books. And that's really crossing the divide. So the, the conflict at juvenile court for families is the, the family versus the state, whereas the conflict in family court are the two parents or two couple, the two husband wife fighting. Um, and it's kind of an interesting dynamic to just turn it slightly um, and you get a different uh, viewpoint. All right, children, I'm really, um, I strongly believe in listening to children's voices. And this is um, a poem that a child wrote in a divorce case. And I'll read it for you because it's, I know how to read it. Um, but divorcing, um, a word picture, I gotta come over here because I can't see. A word and picture poem of joy and sad. I love my dad and mom both. But my dad began to drink, and my heart began to sink. So they started to, this is fighting, um, and my heart took flight. They broke up, and I now have two homes. Notice this one has a for sale sign outside. And I go between them, and notice one of the parents already has another partner. I'm OK up here, but I'm sad down here. Eight or nine? A little boy. Isn't that amazing? Um, oftentimes, I get the best information from kids because they tell the truth. And I cannot tell you how many kids I are interviewed, and I ask, you know, what do you want? What, you know, what is it that you want your parents to know? Just stop. Just stop. Stop fighting. Just stop it. They say it all the time. So juvenile court. In juvenile court, the conflict is different. So here's a child telling me to give the parent another chance. Slight, it's a different take, right? Different take on, um, on trauma. So this child, and the kids in juvenile court were oftentimes parenting their parents. You know, they'd been, they'd been forced to feed younger siblings, to get themselves dressed, to get themselves to school. This is a juvenile court child. Um, she was in the courtroom, and no one could really get a whole lot out of her. Her attorney was having a hard time communicating with her. And, um, and I had uh, paper and pens available. And so um, she had some pens, and she um, drew this during the court hearing. And her attorney looked at it and whispered to her and asked if she could give it to me, and, and she did. So um, you can see she's tied up. Her clothes are tattered. Um, she's surrounded by scary things, so like an alligator, poison signs, a shark, more alligators. Um, and she says, help me. She has tears coming down. And then there's this creepy guy, 
And it looks like she's tied up in a room. And she said, this says, you will die. Um, no one will help you. And you never know when you're going to get something like this on the bench. And again, your background, right? What I bring to the bench helps me cope with that. OK, trigger warning. This uh, domestic violence. So um, this is a case where the father um, threatened to kill the uh, wife. And the next day, he changed his profile picture to this. This is a stock image. This is not him. Powerful evidence. We're seeing more and more social media evidence, more and more um, of stuff. You know, all the stuff that gets put on media comes in my courtroom. I, um, I see a lot of penises. I don't know why, but people like to present their dick pics to me in court. And, um, and so the lawyers in my court know that if it's going to be a picture of a genitalia, to please warn me, put a red sheet over it. So I get a lot of red sheets. I, I cannot tell you how many people present evidence like that in a courtroom. It is bizarre. I never want to see it. I don't know any women who want to see that. Um, but it comes in because people harass their former loved ones by sending genitalia pictures. I did not provide any of those. Don't worry. <laughs> um, this was presented to me by um, a husband. And I don't even know what the text was meant to be about. I didn't even get to the text because all I saw was this. So this is how he has his ex-wife in his phone. She is named Whore. This is not her picture. This is a stock image of a woman who's been beaten. And the children are six and seven. And guess whose phone they use to call their mom? Here, call your mom, the whore. And I cannot tell you how upset I was by that. And um, we had him change his phone in the courtroom. I, I don't, in the courtroom. It was, I, I wasn't going to let him leave until he put something more appropriate in. This is another domestic violence case where um, the husband cut up one of every single one of the wife's shoes so that she could not leave with dignity. She could not leave with dignity. She'd have to leave wearing different shoes. Oh, the snake, sorry. Look away. Look away, mom. My mom hates snakes. So um, I have a lot of cases that come in on an emergency basis. And this one was a case where the mom claimed that the, um, her ex had a new pet, and she was concerned for the safety of her children. And I thought, and it didn't say what the pet was. And I thought, oh, it's going to be a pit bull. Great. You know? But I said it. You know, We're going to deal with it. It wasn't a pit bull. It was a rattlesnake. <laughs> the guy had, gotten a rat, had, had captured a rattlesnake and had the rattlesnake living in the house with the children, and the rattlesnake needs to eat, so he gave the children rifles to go shoot things and feed the rattlesnake. And you just can't make stuff like this up. You just can't. So that involved a call. I had to call like an animal, like the wild, I called the Desert Museum, actually. I'm like, I don't know who to call. Like, who do I call? There's a rattlesnake in someone's house. I took the kids out of the house until I knew what was going on. Um, and then there was a big investigation. Yeah. I, I felt terrible for the snake, too. I mean, it was just awful. The whole thing was awful. OK, we're almost at the end. So um, we hear traumatic things every day, right? And vicarious trauma is really real. No one comes to see me because they're happy. No one. And so I hear all of their problems, all of the horrible things that are happening. And oftentimes, especially for self-represented litigants, it's the first time they've ever told their story. And it's a big deal. Every court hearing is meaningful. Every court hearing is, um, is a powerful event for these folks. And so if you um, have an opportunity to see behind the bench of a judge, you will notice that we create shields, protective shields and of little pictures of our animals, our kids, our dogs, little sayings. I have a rock from Sedona that's meant to ward off evil spirits that my college friends sent me. Um, and this is one of the things that travels with me to every bench I go. And it's just a reminder of why I'm doing what I'm doing every single day. And it's tattered and yellowed. And it's the words I look at every single day. I, I, I read that. And that kind of reflects, I think, how I approach families. 
Okay, one final. Um, are we good on time? Are we okay? Yeah. One final um, piece I wanted to share with you. Um, I write a lot. Um, I write usually humor pieces. I write for a, a, a college group that has about 14,000 women on it. And I write mostly humor, but sometimes I write about <coughs> things that really hit me. And this is one of the things I wrote recently, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, I saw an article this week about a man who was shaving on a train headed from New York City to New Jersey. And someone saw him with shaving cream lathered on his face, quietly shaving while seated on the train. The person chose to video him and put the images on social media. It resulted in a barrage of insults about how gross the man was, how weird he was, how disgusting he was. The gentleman happened to see the video, and he responded. He told people he had made, that who had made ugly comments that he'd been living in a homeless shelter. A relative wired him enough money to get home to his family, and he didn't want his family to be alarmed by his unshaven face. He didn't want them to know he was homeless. I don't know if the story is true. I just know that it could be true. I think it turned out that it was true. You never truly know what's happening in someone's life unless it's appropriate for you to ask. Mocking, laughing, ridiculing, name calling, it comes too easily. It's a cop out, a way to make us feel better about another person's plight. Today my calendar was full when a man entered the courtroom. He had long hair, he looked unbathed, he had a knit, knit cap on, it was 100 degrees outside, plus an additional hat. He had layers of clothing and a bag that was overstuffed, and he quietly took a seat in the rear of the courtroom. As witnesses transitioned, I turned my attention to him and I asked, sir, are you here for the 10 a.m. trial? And he plainly answered, no. Are you just observing? And he nodded affirmatively. I realized then that he was likely homeless, and I thought about that man on the train. This man needed a cool place to sit, where no one would bother him, where it was safe where there was a bathroom down the hall and a water fountain close by. He just wanted to sit, to be, and that was okay. When we broke for lunch, the man quietly exited, and the couple who were getting divorced and their attorneys were still in the courtroom. They all looked at me. I knew they wanted to know who the man was, and one of the lawyers said, Judge, is that guy in here all the time? And the husband said, he made me nervous. And the wife said, he looks suspicious. And I explained that my courtroom is an open place, that it's a safe zone, that anyone was welcome so long as he or she was not disruptive. The man had not done anything to suggest he was dangerous or a threat. Just like the man on the train, he seemed out of place. They all accepted my analysis and we broke for lunch. I usually actually eat lunch in my office, but that day I had a meeting during lunch and on my way back I passed Subway. On impulse, I dashed in and bought a sandwich with chips and I had an apple in my fridge and a snack pack with cheese and nuts, and before the afternoon session began, I placed the food on the chair where the man had been sitting. I hoped he would return. At 1.45, he returned, and I saw him stop short when he saw the collection of food on the chair. He glanced at me. I nodded and gave him a slight smile. I briefly saw the hint of a smile on his face, and I could see him packing the food in his bag, and he sat, and his shoulders relaxed, and he stared at the ceiling, and he fell asleep. This young man is someone's son. I hope he returns. Thank you.